we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 80 of Urgency of Change. Each weekly episode in this season of the Krishnamurti podcast is based on a major theme of the philosopher's talks, such as freedom, self-knowledge, beauty, intelligence and meditation. Extracts from our archives have been carefully selected to represent Krishnamurti's different approaches to each of these universal and timelessly relevant themes. This week's theme is thought. Upcoming themes are psychological evolution, loneliness and nature and the environment. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. For more information about our activities and programmes, such as our volunteer programme at Brockwood Park in the UK, we are online at kfoundation.org. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. This week's podcast has seven sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's first talk at Brockwood Park in 1984, titled, What is Thinking? What is thinking? We spend our days and nights and years in thinking. All our actions are based on thinking. In our relationship with each other, thinking plays an immense part. Thinking is part of recognition, knowledge. (coughs) Thinking has done extraordinary things subjectively. From the latest bomb, the atom bomb, to the most complicated ceramic structure, the great battleships, submarines, computers, and also thinking has given mankind great medicine, surgery, and so on. So we have to inquire, what is thinking? When the question is asked, what is thinking? Are you thinking or listening to the question, what is thinking, and observe thinking? Have a cock. You've understood? Yes. No, don't think, please. This. <laughs> You're asking, someone is asking you, what is thinking? Do you immediately find what is thinking, work at it, or inquire, search, or Do you listen to the question? You understand? Listen, which means there must be quality of silence when you are listening. Right? (laughs) We are asking what is thinking. Probably you've never asked this question. 
of yourself or perhaps the professionals have not written about it. Perhaps you're used to being told by the professionals what he's thinking and then you will repeat. But that is not the that that prevents inquiry into what he's thinking. You are just merely repeating. That's not thinking. So what is thinking? What is the origin of thought? The thought that has put man on the moon? The thought that has divided the world into nationalities? The thought that has made wars? The thought between you and your wife and husband, girl, boy and so on? What is this enormous energy of thought? Is not thinking a process of the res- or process of memory? Right? Process of memory. Memory is stored in the brain, which memory comes with knowledge. Knowledge is based on experience, right? All scientific knowledge is based on experiment, theories, hypothesis, knowledge. Always adding more and more and more in any field, whether it be in the mathematical world, biological or aerodynamics and so on. In every field knowledge is based on experience. When the knowledge is being added all the time, accumulated, therefore experience is limited. So knowledge is limited, right? both now and in the future, because knowledge is always limited. And so memory is limited, and thus thought is limited. Anything that is limited must cause conflict. Right? If one is thinking about oneself from morning till night, as most people do, their worries, their problems, their like and dislike, they are perpetually concerned with their own self, that's a very, very limited way of living. And therefore, that which is limited must inevitably cause conflict. The second extract is from the second talk in Madras, 1979, titled Thought is Limited. Thought is always active. It is never still. And man has said, you must make it still in order to you understand? You, in order to find some sp- higher spiritual consciousness, which I doubt, there is no higher spiritual consciousness. There is only consciousness. Man has invented super, super, super consciousness which is that invention is the product of thought. 
and the people who talk about super consciousness are worshipped, made into extraordinary gurus, because you also want super consciousness, but you never examine that thought has produced this whole area of consciousness. Whatever it thinks is still part of that consciousness. You understand this? Are we moving along together? Or are you tired? If you are, well, let's take a rest. I can go on talking to myself. Because I like I'm investigating as I go along. If you are tired, please take a rest. Because we are asking your brain to think anew, to look at things afresh, not in the old traditional way. To look at your life as it is anew, afresh. And that's the and that's the challenge that the brain may get tired of. It wants give me a moment. Let me be quiet so that I can recapture. So we are saying that thought has created our society and all the miseries contained in that society, the class division, the rich man, the poor man, the man of power, the man of position, man of greatness, and the poor, the downtrodden, and all that, and all the gods of the, on the earth are created by thought. The temples in which the gods are supposed to live are the construction of thought. All the rituals, the dogmas, the beliefs, the puja that you perform every day in the hope of having some kind of peace, and all the so-called meditations, the transcendental and the other nonsensical meditations, are based on thought. And thought is always limited. Right? There is no limitless thought. Thought can think it is limitless, that it can find the immeasurable. That's one part of its illusion, because thought is the outcome of knowledge, memory, and therefore it is time-binding and therefore limited. Right? Do you, are you attending to this? Do you listen to this? When I ask a question, your thought is comes into activity, and it is beginning to ask, search to find the answer, and to find the answer it goes back to memory. Where did I read it? Who told me? You follow? The activity goes on. Whereas if you are asked a question that you do not know, and you cannot find it in books, from your guru, from anything, 
then your mind naturally, your brain naturally says, I really don't know. Right? Uh, are you in that position? Uh, you follow? Can you ever say to yourself, I don't know? Because that quality of mind that says, I don't know, is not seeking to know. Because the moment it seeks, thought is in operation, and then it will project what it wants and will say, I have found it. You understand all this? Are you getting tired? So, to enquire is to have a mind that doesn't know. And we are enquiring into an action of which you are not aware at all. We know our actions based on memory. That's simple, clear. And we know the technological activity of knowledge, the accumulation of thousands of people, scientists working, accumulating. And from that accumulation they have created extraordinary things, most marvellous surgery, most delicate, extraordinary things they are doing. And also, Technologically they are preparing destructions of war, material for war. And also thought has created the illusions. Right? I believe in God. I am a nationalist. I belong to this party which is going to save mankind. My guru is the most marvellous entity. And so on and on and on. All that is the movement of thought. So whatever thought in its action must inevitably be limited. Now, have you an insight into that? You understand? If you attend very carefully to what is being said, then you will see the whole movement of thought. The hidden thoughts, the open thoughts, the thoughts that are extraordinarily secretive, hidden, doesn't want to be open. The whole structure and nature of thought. When you have an insight into it, you give thought to it, thought gives itself its own place. You get what I'm saying? Have you got what I'm saying? The meaning of the word art. means to put everything in its right place. The art of living, not the painting and sculptures that has its own art, but I'm, we are talking about the art of living. And that in there art means to put all things in their, in their place so as to give order. So, the art of living is to find out, is for thought to find out its own place. Have you understood? Huh? Can you do it? That is, 
to give knowledge its right place. And psychologically, knowledge has no place. Have you understood, madam? No? At least somebody says he doesn't. I'm glad. I think most of us have never looked at the movement of thought, right? Most of us never asked what is thinking. Why has man given such extraordinary importance to thinking? And the very th- process of thinking, born of experience, knowledge and memory stored in the brain, that process of thinking is always limited. Right? Is that clear? Thought is limited. Thought is fragmentary. Fragment, I mean, something broken, like a vase, when you break it there are pieces in it. So thought is broken, limited, right? Because it's born out of knowledge. And knowledge is the past. Knowledge is not the whole, whole. Right? See, it can never be the whole. So thought, whatever it does, must be limited. And any action born out of that limitation must have regret, confusion, feeling of guilt, anxiety, and a never-ending conflict, because thought in its action is limited. Right? Is this clear? Clear, not verbally, adentro, inside, you know it. As you know your language, as you know your eyes, your face, you know it. So thought can never lead to the immeasurable. That which is not measurable. Thought is measurable. And therefore, that which is measurable is limited. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's first talk in Sanan, 1980, titled Is Thought the Cause of Chaos? You have to exercise thought when you drive a car. You have to exercise thought when you go do your business, in the office or in the factory or in, at home. When you cook, when you wash dishes, whatever one does, you will physically, one must have knowledge. Psychologically, is knowledge necessary at all? You follow them? Please go into it carefully. And is the origin, cause of all this existence, with all its chaos and misery, confusion, uncertainty, security, etc., etc., is thought the cause of all this? And if it is the if thought is the cause of it, then thought can be ended. 
You follow? Where there is a cause, there can there is an end. Where there is a beginning, there is an ending. If you are addicted or if you are a smoker, there was a cause and you can end it. So similarly, if thought is the cause of this state of the world, then that can be ended. And with the ending there is a new beginning, totally different from that which thought has put together. You following all this? So is that is thought the origin of all this? Would you like me? Would you like the speaker to go into all this? Yes, please. Not for you to follow. I am not your guru. Thank God. I am not your leader. I am not your philosopher. But the speaker has gone into this matter very, very deeply. All his life he has done this. To come to a point where he has found for himself, found, realised the cause of all this. So we are asking one question. Perhaps there is no other cause but this one cause, thought. See, man has never gone into this question of thought. They are just beginning. Scientists are beginning to inquire. The Hindus have gone into it up to a certain point, the ancient Hindus, and stopped somewhere else. But we, a common people, ordinary people, with our daily problems and anxieties, our attachments and our griefs and our pains, we are asking this question. Is the is all this the result of thought? Thought includes feeling, sensation. the pleasures, the fears, all that is part of thought. And if thought has created this world in which we live, some of it with great beauty, the marvellous cathedrals, the mosques, the temples, the poems, the literature, but what is inside the cathedrals, the mosques, the the temples are put there by thought. The speaker once, some years ago, in India, was speaking all over India and he happened to be behind Mr. Gandhi. 
and Mr. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, whatever you like to call him, was saying that everybody could enter the temples. At that time only the Brahmins, Brahmanas, could enter into the temples. And he was saying, gods are in the temple, anybody can enter. So the speaker was following him. Next week he came to the same town next week. And so they asked him to catch him out, because he was a Brahmana. So he said, what do you say? Should non brahmins should enter temples? And it was a very simple answer, which is, God doesn't exist in temples. If he exists at all, it is somewhere else, totally outside of man's thought, right? But they didn't like that. So it goes on. So I'm asking you, if thought is the result of this chaos, and if thought is the cause of this chaos, thought can end and something totally new can begin. And it's your responsibility as a human being, not as an individual, as a human being, human being who is in China, in India, Asiatic world, in the Arabic, in the Middle East, West, East, you're at that human being is asking this question. Is that the cause? And if it is the cause, then how that cause can be dissipated and therefore the ending of it. Therefore, from the, <coughs> from the ending of it, a new beginning, a totally new beginning, which is the real revolution, not the communist, not the terrorists, and so on. What is your responsibility and what is your answer to that question? Do you understand? The ball is in your court. The fourth extract is from the first question and answer meeting in Bombay, 1984, titled, You Are Thought. What are you? If you are really frank, serious, when that question is put to you, what are you? Aren't you your name? Aren't you your face, your eyes, your nose, your hair, and so on, physically? Aren't you the anger? Aren't you the greed? Or the greed is separate from you? Aren't you, when there is anxiety, aren't you that anxiety? When you are suffering, suffering when, uh, when one loses one's wife, husband, children, or grandmother, you know all that. Aren't you, are you not suffering? And is that suffering something separate from you? Aren't you all that? Or do you think, think that you are separate from all that? Right, sir? 
Are you separate from all that? Are you separate from your anger, jealousy, from your bank account? Huh? You are your bank account, aren't you? Or if I take away your bank account, which that's not me, would you say that? You can take my bank account, because it's not me. How you would howl if I took away your bank account? So you are your bank account. You are your furniture. You are your house. You are insurance. You are mortgage. You are money. But if you say, "I am not all that. I am. There is something in me that is watching all this." Is that a fact, or you have invented it? Many people say there is super, super consciousness above all this consciousness. That is, is that not invented by thought? Right? Is not your bank account, not the coin, not the note. All that is not the result of thought. Is not your recognition of your wife, your husband. Is not all. Isn't that? Isn't that thought? So aren't you? All the memory of the past, all the tradition of the past, as a Hindu, as they say, you know, Brahman, non-Brahman, all that business, aren't you all that? Of course you are. So you are the knowledge which is the past. You are, you are, you are nothing but memories. Would you accept that? Of course not. Aren't you? If you are, all your memories were taken away, what are you? You would be a vegetable. So your memories, which is always the past, is what you are. Your tradition, as a Hindu, as a Parsi, as a Muslim, and so on, that's the result of years of propaganda, years of tradition, which is the activity of thought. So you are thought. If you don't think at all, what are you? So you are the whole, the whole content of the past. That past is modifying itself in the present and continues as the future. So you are the past, the present, and the future. In you, all time is contained. But you don't understand all this, does it? And the self, the me, my name, my quality, my achievement, my ambition, my pain, my sorrow, is all the past. And so the self is the essence of the past. 
which is memory, knowledge, and therefore the self is very, very, very limited. And that's why the Self is causing so much mischief in the world. Each Self is out for itself. You are out for your own Self, aren't you? If you are honest, see this clearly, aren't you out for yourself, your ambition, your achievement, your fulfilment, your satisfaction. So, for is you. Thought is limited, because all knowledge is limited. Therefore, you are, you are, your self is the most limited thing. And therefore you are causing enormous sorrow, enormous conflict. Because the, the self is separated, divisive. So sirs, I the speaker has explained. The explanation is not the fact. The fact is for you to see this for yourself. If you see this for yourself and say, I like the way I'm going on, perfectly all right. But you know for yourself that you are creating havoc in the world. And you prefer to live that way? Good luck to you. But there might be some who say, that's not the way to live. One must live with a global mind, brain, without any division, without any nationality, without any self. Don't make that into some kind of heightened illumination, only few can reach it. Anybody who sets his mind, his brain and heart to understand the nature of the Self and be free of that Self, anybody can do it if they put their mind. The fifth extract is from Krishnamurti's second question and answer meeting at Brookwood Park in 1979, titled Can Thought Be Aware of Itself as It Arises? Can thought be aware of itself as it arises? Not after, which is fairly simple, which is what most of us do. But the question is, <coughs> Can thought, as it arises, be, can there be awareness of that? You understand the question? You understand the question at least? Can you be aware, please listen to this, of your thought? Can, that is, can thought be aware of itself? as it arises. You understand the question? That is, you are, your whole, one's whole life is based on thought. Thought recognizing the emotion the sentiment, the romantic feelings, the imagination, so on. Thought is recognizing all this, right? Oh, I'm very emotional, and so on. Now, thought is the is 
our instrument of all action. Right? Therefore, there is no spontaneity. If you look into yourself seriously, spontaneity can only exist when there is complete, total freedom. Psychologically. So, th- can you, can your mind be aware of itself as thought arises? That is, can you be, can one be, is there an awareness as when you begin to be angry? You follow all this? Can there be an awareness as jealousy arises? Can there be an awareness as greed comes like a be aware of that. Can there be? Or you are aware that you have been jealous, or that you have been greedy, or that you have been angry. That's fairly simple. Most of us do that. But to be aware so attentively, you can see for yourself the anger coming in, the adrenaline and all the processes, the whole movement of anger. You can see greed come into being. See something you want, and the, you follow the reaction. To be to be aware of that, of course one can, as it arises. Now the question is a little more difficult, more deep. Is can thought? Please listen to this. Which is, you can be aware as anger arises. That's very simple. But is there an awareness of thought? Th- awareness of thought itself. I want, you understand what I'm saying. You are thinking now, aren't you? Or are you all <laughs> absent-minded? You are thinking now, aren't you? Now, as you are thinking, find out if that thinking can be aware of itself, not you aware of thinking. You, you understand the problem? I wonder if you see this. For it is great. It's ex- this is really great fun if you go into it. Not only fun, it's very, very serious, because we can go very, very deeply into all this. That is, you are thinking about something, about your dress or your look, or what people have said, what uh, you're going to meet, and this and that. Thinking is there. Now, take one thought, and see if that thought can know itself. Oh, yes, sir, this, is, this requires tremendous attention, and which you are not used to. You are thinking about the dress you have had or you are going to buy. The thought that arises, can that thought say, yes, I'm awake? You understand? I'm aw- I see myself itself, not you observe the thought, because you are also thought. You understand? So you are not aware as thought arises. But thought itself is aware as it comes into being. The sixth extract is from the seventh talk in Sanan, 1971, titled, Can Thought Be Completely Silent? 
One must have noticed what a little space one has, how crowded it is in our souls. Please watch it in yourself. And how is one being isolated in that little space with enormous thick walls of resistance, of ideas and of aggression? How is one to have space that is really immeasurable? As we said the other day, thought is measurable. Thought is measurable. And any form of self improvement is measurable. And obviously, self improvement is the most callous form of isolation. And one sees that thought cannot bring about the, the vast space in which there is complete and utter silence. You are following? Thought cannot bring it. Thought can only progress, evolve, in ratio to the end it projects, which is measurable. And that space which thought creates imaginatively or of necessity can never enter or come into a dimension in which there is space which is not of thought. You understand my question? Thought has built through centuries a space that is very, very limited, narrow, isolated. And because of this very isolation, narrowness, it creates division. And where there is division, there is conflict, nationally, religiously, politically, in every way, in relationship and so on. That conflict is measurable. The less conflict and the more conflict, and so on. My question is, how can thought enter into the other? Or the other is not, is, thought can never enter into it. You understood? I am the result of thought. All my activities are based on thought, logic, illogic, neurotic, or highly educated, sophisticated, rational, scientific, technological. I am the result of all that. And that has space within the walls of resistance. Now, how is the mind to change all that and discover something which is a totally different dimension? You've understood my question? Are we meeting each other? Can the two come together? 
the freedom in which there is complete silence and therefore vast space, and the walls of resistance which I have, which thought has created, with its narrow little space, can the two come together and float together? Right? That this has been the problem of man religiously. At, when he inquires at great depth, this is the problem. Can I hold on to my little ego, to my little space, to the things that I have collected, knowledge, the experiences, the hopes, the pleasures, and move into a different dimension where the two can operate? I want to sit at the right hand of God, and yet I want to be free of God. I want to live a life of great delight and pleasure and beauty, and yet I want to have Joy which is not measurable, which is not, which cannot be caught by thought. You follow? I want pleasure and joy. I know the movement of pleasure, the demands of pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure, with all its fears, travails, sorrow, agony, anxiety. And also I know that joy which is totally uninvited, which thought can never capture. If it does capture, it becomes pleasure, and then it's the old thing, the old routine begins. So I want to have both. the things of the world and the other world. I think this is what is the problem with most of us. Isn't it? To have a thumping good time in this world, why not? And avoid all pain, all pleasure, avoid all pain, all sorrow. Because I also know at moments when there is great joy which cannot be touched, which is not corrupt. I want both. And that's what we are seeking. Carry all our burden and yet seeking freedom. And can I do this? Can I, through will, you understand what we said the other day about will, Will has nothing whatsoever to do with what is, but will is the expression of desire as me. And we think somehow through will we shall come upon the other. So we say to ourselves, I must control thought. 
I must discipline thought. When the eye says I must control, I must discipline thought, it is still thought. Separated itself as the eye and thought as something separate. But still thought. The eye and the not eye. And thought, one realizes, being measurable, being noisy, chattering, running all over the place, has created the space of a little rat, that monkey that chases its own tail. So one says, how am I, how, do, how is thought to become quiet? Because thought has created the technological world and the world of chaos. The world of war, the national divisions, the religious separations. Thought has brought about misery, confusion, sorrow. Thought is time. So time is sorrow. And one sees all this if you have gone very, very, very deeply, not at the instruction of another, but merely observing this in the world and in yourself, then the question arises, can thought be completely silent and only function when necessary? Do you follow? And necessary when it has used knowledge, technology, going to the office, talking, and all the rest of it. And the rest of the time absolutely quiet. But the more there is that space and silence the more it can function logically, sanely, healthily, with knowledge. Otherwise, knowledge becomes an end in itself and brings about chaos. Are you following all that? Not agreeing with me, you see it yourself. So the question is, Thought, which is the response of memory, knowledge, experience, time, and thought is the content of consciousness. Knowing thought must function with knowledge, and it can only function with, with highest intelligence only when there is space and silence and from their function. You're Am I make myself clear? Have I? Have I, sir? Do tell me, encourage me, will you? No, I don't want your encouragement, sorry. <laughs> so that's my problem. That is, there must be vast space and silence because when there is that space and silence, beauty comes, love there is. Not the beauty 
put together by man, the architecture, the tapestry, the porcelain, the painting, the poem, the line of the architecture, of the architect. But that sense of beauty, of vast peace and silence, and yet thought must act, function. One can't, there is no living there and then coming down. So that's my problem. Not my problem, really, because (laughs) you understand? I'm making it a problem so that that we can investigate it together, so that both you and I discover in this, this invested in something totally new. Because each time one investigates, not knowing, one discovers something. But if you investigate with knowing, then you will never discover anything. And that's what we're doing. Can thought become silent? And can that thought, which must function in the field of knowledge, totally, completely, objectively, sanely, healthily, rationally, can that thought end itself that he can thought, which is the past, which is memory, which is thousand yesterdays, can all that past come totally to an end, which is all that conditioning, so that there is silence, there is space, there is a sense of extraordinary dimension. So I'm asking myself, and you are asking it with me, how is thought to end? And not in the very ending of it, pervert it and go off into some imaginative state and become rather lopsided, neurotic and vague. I thought must function with great vitality, great energy, with logically safety. And so I'm asking, how is that thought which must function and at the same time be completely motionless? You got it? You got my question? You have understood my question, right, sir? This has been a problem of every serious religious man. Not the man who belongs to some sect, whether Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever it is which are based on organized belief and propaganda and therefore not a religion at all. This has been the problem. As one digs very, very, very deeply, can the two operate together? You understand? 
Can the two move together, not coalesce, not join together, move together? And they can only move together if thought doesn't separate itself as the observer and the observed. You're getting it, Emma? You follow? I want to spin ahead. You see, life is a movement in relationship, constantly moving, changing. And that movement can sustain itself, move freely when there is no division between the thinker and the thought. That is, when the thought doesn't divide itself as the me and the not me. When thought doesn't divide itself as the observer, the experiencer, and the observed and the experience. Because in that there is division and therefore conflict. When thought sees the truth of that, then it is not seeking experience. Then it is moving in experiencing. Are you getting this? Aren't you doing this now? Look, sir, I said just now, thought, with all the knowledge, always accumulating, is a living thing, not a dead thing. Therefore, it, the, the vast space can move together with, with thought. And when the thought separates itself as the thinker, as the experiencer, then the experiencer, the observer, the thinker becomes the past. And therefore there is, there is a division and conflict and the past which is stationary, right? You, and therefore cannot move. Are you getting this? Am I talking to myself? Are we sharing this together? I see in this examination, the mind sees that where there is division in thought, movement is not possible. Movement. Where there is division, the past comes in, and therefore the past becomes stationary, the center, the immovable center. The immovable center can be modified, added, but it is an immovable state, and therefore it cannot, it has no free movement.
So my next question is, to myself and therefore to you, can so does thought see this, or is perception something entirely different from thought? You, huh? Okay, I can't meet people. Look, one sees division in the world, national, religious, economic, social and all the rest of it, class, and in this division there is conflict, that's clear. Just listen to this, I've got it. And when there is division in myself, fragmentation, there must be conflict. When in myself I am divided as the observer and the observed, the thinker and the thought, the experience and the experience, that very division is created by thought, and thought which is the result of the past. Now, I see the truth of this. My question is, does thought see this, or some other factor sees this? Are you meeting the... do we understand? And I say, I see this, the truth of it. Does, so, that, does thought see the truth or some other factor sees the truth? Or the new factor is intelligence and not thought. Now what is the relationship between thought and intelligence? You understand my question? I'm terribly interested in this. Personally, I'm, hmm, you can come with me or not. I'm really, this is extraordinary going to this. Thought has created this division, the past, the present and the future. Thought is time. And Thought says to itself, I see this division outwardly and inwardly. And I see this division is a factor of conflict and is not capable to go beyond it. Therefore, it says, I am, what's the I am where I began. I've left, I'm still with my conflicts. Because thought says, I see the truth of division and conflict. Now, does thought see that or a new factor of intelligence sees that? Right? Now, if it is intelligence that sees that, then what is the relationship between thought and intelligence? Is intelligence personal? Is intelligence the result of book knowledge, logic, living, experience? Or is intelligence the freedom from the division of fall, of division which thought has created? And logically seeing that and not being able to go beyond it remains with it, not try to struggle and not try to overcome it. Out of that comes intelligence. Right, sir? Am I making myself? Yes. 
So we are asking, what is intelligence? Is intelligence cultivable? Is intelligence innate? And does so that does thought see the truth of conflict, division and all the rest of it? Or it is the quality of mind I've got it. It is the quality of mind that it sees the fact and is completely quiet with the fact. Completely silent with the fact. Not try to go beyond it, overcome it, change it, but completely still with the fact. It is that stillness that is intelligence. Got it. So intelligence is not thought. Intelligence is the science. And therefore totally impersonal. Doesn't belong to any group, to any person, to any race, to any culture. So, I have found, mine has found, that where there is silence, not put together by thought and discipline, practice and all that terrible horror, but seeing, seeing that thought cannot possibly go beyond itself, because thought is the result of the past, and where the past is functioning it must create division, and therefore conflict, sorrow and all the rest of it. Seeing that, and remaining completely still with that, You know, it's like being completely still with sorrow. You know, somebody whom you love or whom, for whom you care, whom you have looked after, cherished, loved, concerned with, when that person dies there is the shock of loneliness, despair, sense of isolation, everything falls round you, in that sorrow to remain with it, not seeking explanation, the cause, why should he go and why not I, to remain completely still with it. The, to remain with it completely still is intelligence. And that intelligence then can operate in thought, using knowledge. And that knowledge and thought, thought will not create division. The final extract this week is from the sixth talk at Rajgat in 1962, titled Letting Every Thought Flower in Freedom. Thought creates all the divisions that exist in love. Godly love and human love and all the rest of it. And 
is not the quality of mind that has complete leisure, that has never, that is, that is, that has come into being through understanding, observing, acquired. a sense of silence. To me, for me, this whole process of investigation into oneself is meditation. Meditation is not the repetition of words and formulas mesmerizing oneself into all kinds of mm, fanciful states. If you take opium, a tranquilizer, it will give you marvelous visions. But that's not meditation. Meditation is actually this process of investigation into oneself. So, all right, sirs, do please pay attention, doesn't matter who comes. And if you go into it deeply yourself, you are bound to come across all this. Whether it is possible to think without the center, to see without the center, to act so completely without idea and approximation, to love without the center, and therefore without thought and feeling. And when you have gone through all that, to find out for yourself a mind that is completely free and has no borders, no frontiers, a mind that is free which has never been, which does not come about through discipline. And if one has gone that far, one begins to see, or rather the the mind itself begins to observe, the thing itself is, unfolds, that the quality of time – the quality, that is, the yesterday, the today and tomorrow – has completely changed. Therefore, action is not in terms of yesterday, today and tomorrow. Because such action has no motive. And all motive has its root in the past. And any action born of that motive is still an approximation So, meditation is the total awareness of every movement of thought. And never denying thought. 
which means give let every thought flower in freedom and it's only in freedom every thought can flower and come to an end so out of this labor if it can be called labor which is really out of this observation <clears throat> a mind which has understood all this such a mind is a quiet mind such a mind knows what it is to be really quiet to be really still 